Hi, everyone. I'm Ted O'Toole, guiding teacher of Minnesota Zen Meditation Center. And I'd like to welcome everyone to our virtual Zendo this evening. We have a wonderful guest speaker and a very special program tonight. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to Ben Connolly, who is one of the senior priests here at MZMC. And he will introduce our guest and he will be facilitating the evening's program. Ben? Thank you, Ted. Hello, my name is Ben. Uh, I'm a teacher here at MZMC. I'm located in Minneapolis right now near the building of Minnesota Zen Meditation Center on Dakota land. And I'm really uh, overjoyed and grateful for the opportunity to be in conversation with Osho Zenju Earthland Manual this evening. Uh, I just want to tell you a little bit about the format for the evening and then I'll, I'll introduce our speaker and then I'll uh, offer some questions. So the idea here is I will ask some questions of Zanju and we'll be in conversation for about 40 minutes and then we'll have about a half an hour or something like that for questions from you. And the way we have the meeting set up is if you have a question for Zenju, you can type it into the chat and that will come to me. And so when the time comes for the questions from the community, I will look through those questions and try and pick ones that seem like they will um, be beneficial to the group. And I will ask them of Zenju and we'll see what she brings. <clears throat> um, I do through for this meeting, I encourage you to use speaker view, but you're welcome to use the gallery view. Sometimes it's nice to see a lot of faces, but I think speaker view will probably work well for the format of this meeting. <clears throat> so, uh, Osho Zenju Earthland Manual is an author, a poet, an artist, a teacher, a Soto Zen Buddhist priest, uh, a Dharma heir of the beloved uh, Zenke Blanche Hartman, uh, former abbess of San Francisco Zen Center. Zendru has written a number of great books. Uh, some of them are Sanctuary, The Deepest Peace, The Way of Tenderness, and Tell Me Something About Buddhism. <clears throat> uh, her practice is both deeply immersed in the Soto Zen tradition, but is also um, includes elements of uh, Native American practices and indigenous act, uh, African spiritual practices. She's from California, but dwelling now, I believe, in New Mexico. And I just, you know, on a personal note, I just remember I was in San Francisco uh, and at the San Francisco Zen Center. And just uh, by great fortune, uh, that morning, Zenju was giving a talk. And I went in and I heard that talk and I, I left with a book. And uh, I even got, I even got a signature, uh, which was very exciting. Um, and so, you know, that occasion really prompted me to just want to hear more. And so I'm, I'm really grateful um, and, uh, and honored to be in conversation with you this evening, Zenju. Let me just make a change to my setup. And uh, yes, so uh, welcome. And I would like to start uh, with this uh, question. So as I read your work, I often see references to the importance or the value of honoring and invoking ancestors, um, relations, inspirations. And so I wonder if you would be willing just to start by sharing maybe a couple of uh, ancestors or teachers or relations that, that you'd like to call in and share some of their inspiration with the group. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ben. Thank you for inviting me to this talk. And um, I would just like to start with uh, acknowledging the uh, Tiwa um, tribe here in New Mexico, Albuquerque in particular. And there are 19 pueblos here and three uh, Apache tribes. And um, there's the uh, Navajo or Dene uh, people here as well. 
So just honoring that land, it's um, rich with uh, spirit and rich with ceremony and culture and ancestral wisdom. So, um, you know, I always call in um, my ancestors. I used to, um, and I start with my own blood line because that's how I got here. I wouldn't be here without all the people that had come before me. And um, so I'm acknowledging them in this moment and um, going back to um, my African ancestors and um, I have had a DNA test. And so <laughs> it's about like 97% African. So uh, I, that's not no joke. And so that um, most people don't have that much, but I uh, am happy about it to be Nigerian, you know, to be, and I call those ancestors in to be with the people of the Cameroon of Mali you know, of the homie, and then all the folks in Louisiana, where my people are from, uh, Creole, Louisiana, and uh, Creole, Haiti, and uh, yeah, I found out I have some Scottish and Ireland and Norway ancestors, so hello, and <laughs> aren't we all in that situation, so um also ancestors are uh, everything on this earth, uh, cause it came, it was here before us when we arrived, all the medicine was here. The moon and the sun and the stars, the trees and the water, everything to support our lives is already here. So we have to honor those ancestors as well. Um, and I like to honor the ancestors of the teachings of Buddha's teachings and Buddha himself, Shakyamuni Buddha for um, withstanding, um, and continuing despite probably, I'm sure there were some naysayers about what he was teaching. <laughs> I don't think everyone was so happy about what he was teaching. And so <laughs> you know, I give thanks that he stuck with that and stayed with it and um, trusted his own wisdom. And I think that's what I get most out of this practice is just um, honing the wisdom and trusting it. And that's what Buddha did. And I think that's a very, and many people have, but uh, this is definitely the path I walked and I'm walking. And um, so, you know, I feel like I'm from all the 10 directions, <laughs> you know, and um, I am a child of, of, of the world, of the universe. So I, I don't, I, I know I'm not, uh, here because of uh, how smart I am or uh, my ability to survive. <laughs> so all of that is just a uh, happenstance. So thank you. I like to ring a bell on that. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Welcome them all in. Mm -hmm. Amen. So, you know, I've been really having a lot of fun preparing for this conversation because it means I get to read all your books again. Um, <laughs> and so I found this quote, and I'm going to read this quote, uh, and then I'm, I'm going to kind of ask you about what's going on here. Okay. This is from The Deepest Peace. Okay. Is that your newest one? I That's think? the newest one. It came out in December last year. Okay, so here's the quotation. Experiencing peace not, need not be an arduous journey of endless work, but rather a moment-to-moment -moment effort of resting in order to engage in loving intimacy with others. In this way, a deeply nourished life can take the direction of liberation by which production, labor, is not the measure of our worth. A vow to rest is a vow for peace. So <laughs> that's powerful. But I don't know, for me, I feel like other people I talk to, it's hard to believe this. You know, the conditioning, the drive, um, 
And so I, I would just love to hear you talk about this more. Rest yeah. is liberation. Yeah. Um, so we're we're raised to survive, right? Um, you know, our parents, you know, they're worried about um, whether or not we can survive in the world when we're young and um, whether or not we can feed ourselves. Was all, all parents, no matter what species, they're concerned about the child and they teach the child or the baby to forage and to you know feed and to to look and to be you know um, vigilant about it you know so they could stay alive and so of course I think all of our parents have that way our guardians whoever raised us um, and my parents definitely were too and um, I think at one point in my life I was working you know really hard. I mean, I have a BA, MA, doctorate, you know, you know, it's like, okay. Um, I got all the degrees you could get and was going to get another doctorate, you know, and, <laughs> and I just heard this voice that came really strong in the middle of a, a, a ceremonial circle. And I just heard the voice saying, you know, um, this, this is not what we intended. And I was like, whoa, you know, you know, the intelligence, I don't know why that was on my mind at the time. What we intended, you know, was for you to uh, have the capacity to love. To love life, to love your life, and to live in the ease of that. Now, you can imagine, you know, you know, years ago, everyone worked so hard you know, no matter what, what your background is, you know, people were pretty poor <laughs> everywhere, you know, decades and decades ago, maybe not that many decades, some, you know, so I think that it's uh, my parents were, and so I just saw them working, but I also knew that I wasn't going to, I didn't want to work all the way to the grave, basically, and, um, and I didn't know how to, how I was going to do that. So rest, uh, sometimes people, you know, you imagine yourself laying in bed or, or something like that. Okay, it's time to rest. So first you go like, well, I don't have time to go to bed because, you know, I have to work. So I remember one time, um, I, I think I was at my desk at work and I was just sitting there. And the, and the person, I guess, boss supervisor says, are you working? And I said, yes. Mm -hmm. And I was just sitting there. And then, so I had this like rule or way with myself in terms of working where I would actually take a rest right in the middle of the work and just stop. And, um, and, and it could last for days. I could take a vacation and come to work every day. <laughs> just, I would just slow the work down instead of keeping it at the level that I felt I was being pushed to do. And then I think they're always pretty surprised that the work got done, you know, because they didn't see me joining them in, in, that, in that push, you know, to be, um, you know, better, good, you know, perfect, you know, on time. And when I was 20, I had um, uh, ulcers at 20 years old, 20 something years old. And I said, oh no. And I knew then that I was um, becoming part of the rat race that I didn't want to be in. And um, never seen an ulcer since in my body, never had, not, not nowhere near it because I just turned my life around and stopped being a procrastinator. And I also stopped trying to overwork, you know, working over, over, over. Now I, I'm a writer. So when I write, I do find myself hard for me to stop writing, you know, to take a break. Um, I might, I mean, hours will have flown by like six or seven hours, you know, and I know you might understand that being, being a writer, you know, you get into the groove and the zone and there it is, you got to keep going. So you connect all these thoughts and sentences and, you know, the themes and make sure that it's all going to land somewhere out there in the end on that page. So you're, you're afraid to let it go, you know, because you don't know if you wake up tomorrow, if that it's going to be there or not. So, um, so it still happens. 
but I know that resting is part of the practice. Mm. It, it actually is the practice to stop, to pause. And in that pause, and when I do pause, there's a new discovery, even about the work I'm doing, you know, and, and how to do it. There's something new arise in that pause and in that rest. The practice of rest actually was introduced to me by Reb Denson Anderson. I went to see him uh, for a practice discussion and I was going on and on about how exhausted I was and I, he said, well, have you ever thought about rest, you know? That's when you kind of feel like, oh, okay, why did I come to the practice? <laughs> that just sounds so obvious. So uh, anyway, it was very good. It hit very hard, and I've wrote, I, you know, I, I've written about it since. As that, that is, that is a practice, you know, to, to stop and um, allow life to uh, unfold, or life allow life to come to you instead of you coming to life. And so the same with my writing, you know, really with the, the, that book, The Deepest Peace, I was trying to see what would come to me as opposed to me writing what I, which all my other books are, I don't think there's any problem with that, but just to, just to practice what that would, what would come out of that. And it was a very interesting book to me for, you know, allowing just it to come without me you know, trying to create some themes or something like that, yeah. Wonderful, yeah, and that flavor in that book is, you can feel it, and actually it's a theme in the book of, and actually I think that segues to my next question, is, you know, so uh, the theme for the retreat for tomorrow is accessing peace in the midst of chaos, and I feel like that's a, there's something in the book about there's like a peace and actually, I'm going to quote from Sanctuary here. Also, same theme. There's a piece that's here, even uh, in the midst of all the um, the samsara, the horror. But I, I want to just read this line mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I think it really gets to this. And then I'm going to kind of ask you to expound if you're willing. <laughs> so here we go. We can have a direct experience of our boundlessness while still understanding the historical origin of our trauma. The sanctuary of freedom surfaces from an awakened heart that fully recognizes an historical experience and the absolute availability of peace. So how's that happen, Zenju? <laughs> <laughs> I'll just throw all those books away. No, I can't. I can't. I can't. I think what I what I experienced in the practice and in my life, because when I started practicing um, Buddhism in 1981, that's when I started practicing Buddhism. I knew that I did. I this couldn't be my whole life. This struggle, this oppression, um, that was directed at me and that I experienced. Right, couldn't be my whole life. I wanted to live fully. It's like, well, you know, what is this? You know, you get the, you know, the bad chip and you die. You know, and so I knew that that couldn't be. That there was something um, important about the suffering, the samsara, the the horror, the hard experience, the difficulties, disruptions, and all these things in life. And so when I entered Zen, I entered with. A, a quest in my heart without an answer. The quest wasn't looking for an answer because there isn't anyone, any answer, but that there was a, a way in which the teachings were being presented as there's peace, there's compassion, there's boundlessness, there's all of these kind of beautiful things, right, in life. And I'm listening, you know, and wondering, and I'm watching too. I'm watching people try to access that, try to access a uh, peace, trying to uh, access everything that's being said, you know, because everyone wants it. So um, this, these absolute experiences of life, that's that statement you just read 
says that it comes through the relative experiences, through the struggle, through the horror, through the everything. Like we're in now as a whole world. We're, mm. we're deep in it, right? Mm. And we and in Nishran, they would say congratulations. Because <laughs> it means that you're just about to get there if we can just be there. And we don't know what there is yet either <laughs> till we're there. And so peace, and even when I was writing in the book, I tried not to define it, you know, but to present it as an experience through the, through the violence, as an, ex, you know, when there were protesting in the street, I wrote something about, can't you hear the poetry in the shouting? Can you hear the poetry in the shouting? You know, so that to, to be able to hear all of it and see all of it and not to shape it and move it into something that you can digest because then you swallow it anyway and you can't because it's just got, it's got too much stuff in it, you know? So, um, so that statement is, is trying to um, open up the perspective of coming through what life has given you. Uh, what life is giving us, all of us, not just our own life, you know, and, and to use it, you know, I, I offer people to use racism to see through, like it's a fire, right? To see through. If, if this becomes that thing that causes so much suffering, you can't see anything, then you suffer. Now, this is my life. This is what I know. You suffer the suffering. I, I, I knew that as my life. So that's why I'm speaking from that. I'm not necessarily speaking the exact words of Buddha or Dogen or anyone, but they do say these things. But, you know, just if you look at your own life, you can see that you have survived, you have come through. And hopefully there's some new wisdom, not lesson. That's the, 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 the mass society has changed it to have you learned your lesson. Mm. that's really not good <laughs> in some situation. Maybe it's good on a psychological level or sociological level for those who are sociologists or psychology. I, psychologists, I don't want to take away from those uh, of, uh, disciplines. But in, in the Dharma and in, in, in Buddhism, you know, that, that is not about the lesson but it's, it's about just going through the fire and then seeing what's there. That's all, it's just seeing what's there once you're through the fire. Because then people keep kind of, okay, I need, if I learn the lesson, the next time I will do it this way. And then they end up right back in the same place, right? Because nothing transformative has happened. If you can pinpoint the, note the lesson, pinpoint the lesson, but nothing has changed right? Because you haven't gone through what has been given to you to go through. Walk on the coals and see where it goes. It will be difficult. It will be hard. So a lot of us like to go around and, you know, say, well, I'm having peace. And you're sitting there, you're meditating. And, you know, you tell your children, your partner, your dog, everybody to be quiet, your neighbor, everybody's got to do all this stuff <laughs> for you to have peace, you know? <laughs> Like, what kind of peace is that? Is that peace? Mm. Really? Is that peace? Or is that just quiet? When, when you're doing zazen or meditating, are you just being quiet? Mm. How do you know the difference? How do you know the difference? I ask myself those questions. And the difference for me, I'm not going to answer. Maybe we'll keep that, that one hanging out there, folks, to just sit and reflect on that, you know, because I, I have an experience of it, you know. I had a, a, a person come to me and say, I just learned how to start talking. I used to be so speechless. And now I just learned, and here we are trying to be silent. I don't know if this is a good thing for me or not, because I'm the kind of person that I need to start talking. And I said, oh, I said, do you see the same, that as the same situation when you're in the Zendo meditating? Silence is the same silence 
that you had when you couldn't talk. You see those two at the same So No. I said, okay. That's all just asking you to look closely at the nature of what you're saying. You know, and maybe you, you are trying to find a way out, you know. And so maybe you've learned to talk, but what are you saying? Mm. <laughs> you know, what are you saying? What's the motivation behind what you're saying and doing? Can you see yourself? That's the practice, not just the silence. It's all these things involved. It's very complex. So that's what that, that is. It's just use, use your life to reach into the absoluteness of, of boundlessness or peace. You can't go after and say, um, I'm, I'm boundless, you know? <laughs> I had a student at the at a Zen center. I said, "Show me how you're non-dual right now. <laughs> Let me see it." Because I believe in non-duality, and I'm non-dual. I said, "Let me see." Because <laughs> <laughs> you can't be it. Mm. You can't be non-dual. You can experience. It can be an experience of a practice through the duality, <laughs> but it's not, we, don't, we don't try to access the non-duality because it wants, we know this, once you access it, what is that? W what have you accessed? What, is, what are you trying to say you're doing? Mm. Even when we say, oh, my practice is, is really good now, I'm starting to notice everything. What does that mean? Have you accomplished something? Where are you going with this? Because there's really no accomplishment. We don't have any in this Zen practice step. There are steps in other traditions. There are. You go boom, boom, boom. You go here, you go there. And the teacher says, go here, go there. But none of that's happening. You know, I mean, they do offer, you know, ordination, but that doesn't necessarily mean anything about um, your life. Dharma transmission does. When you get there, it really has a different twist but uh, won't go into that story. But that, that's what that statement's about. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just a little shifting here for the group, by the way, you know, if there's stuff that uh, Zenju is saying that's prompting questions, you know, you can start to put it into the chat. I won't be looking at it yet, but then, you know, you, know, you can let yourself be inspired uh, with inquisitiveness and uh, that's cool. So there was something you brought up in there that uh, was a theme I really wanted to pull out. And uh, I'm, I'm going to read from your book again. You're like, stop okay. doing that, man. But, you know, you wrote the books. So uh, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this line and then I'm going to frame my, my point here. <clears throat> you wrote, I became intensely interested in living from a place of silence and intimacy a place I begin to call spiritual life. I had allowed silence to be spiritual medicine rather than the coping skill I learned as a child who wanted to be invisible in her dark skin. And I read that and it really hit me because I've spent a lot of time like hearing and, and, and feeling the value of silence as upheld in the Buddhist tradition. But then it's like, I'm reading Audre Lord, And I mean, silence is like so framed is so negative. And you know, your silence will not protect you. And I was like, oh, you're really getting to the core of that question. And so I, I just wonder if you'd be willing to dive into that a little more. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, definitely. If you're reading Audre Lorde, she's not, <laughs> not um, advocating the silence of, of our practices. However, you know, we know there's various kinds of silences. There's a harmful silence, which is maybe what, you know, remember I said the, the person who was asking me about, you know, the difference between her silence she used to have and now she's being silenced, you know, while she mm -hmm. practices to be more silent. And then asked her, is it the same? And I think she came right away, which was wonderful to see that, um, the silence that is in the practice in, in meditation is a listening and it, it, it's a seeing kind of, of, of experience in which you're listening um, to, like when I wrote the book, I was literally listening to mountains. 
I mm-hmm. saw it lived by mountains and trees and, and, and listening to animals and seeing myself. I even wrote it as I felt like I was their scribe. Now they're not speaking English, you know, no, they're not. The words aren't doom, 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 you know, and, um, but there, there is a message when you, I mean, Rumi talks about it a lot. Many of the poets talk about it, the silence in which um, the poetry arises. So what's coming uh, through the silence is not of the mind. So it's wisdom of something that's not, you know, concrete or relative. So when the kind of silence of not speaking when there's great harm, like there is in the world, like, okay, I'm not going to talk about oppression. I'm not going to talk about Palestine, what's happening in Palestine today with all the killing that's going on there. You know, I'm not going to talk about any of it because I'm afraid, excuse me, (coughs) allergy. (coughs) So, um, you're just going to be invisible, you know. <clears throat> I thought I had taken care of this part <laughs> before I came. But it's like he tried to go like this, trying to stop it. <clears throat> so... <clears throat> for me, even when I sit silent around my political views, which I, I still do, not that I don't speak, but I sit silently for some time, like I'm sitting silently with the Palestinian situation. A lot of things have come through my mind in that silence. A lot of wisdom has come up, a lot of sadness about humankind, Mm. a lot of uh, grief. And then this understanding of how, how we got ourselves as human beings into these situations and how we continue. Even if there were no Palestine or no Israel, there would be some other places. And there are some other places in which the same thing's happening, right? Right here on in, right here in our own country. So I, you know, this this level of hatred and which I have had to live with personally, mm-hmm. you know. So the, so I do know that, you know, that there is this um, um, edge that we walk as human beings. And I think these things, I believe that these things happen so that we can awaken, you know, through, you know, it is the location of awakening. And, um, but it, it's not like, oh, I know what they should do. You know, the, I'm going to call uh, Joe Biden and let him know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, um, I, you know, here's my political view. <laughs> I personally expected a war or some kind of a struggle because that is our industry. That's only what Zenju thinks and believes. That's that is our industry. War. Without it, we we don't have any money. You know this country. So that's what I believe. And so we go around to different countries, you know, and um, supply um, our product. I think that what does that mean? So that okay. So we can get mad about that, but what does it mean? What are we doing? As, as human beings when we do that or when we align with it. You know, so some people say, well, that's not me. Don't include me in racism. Don't include me in anything that's going on over there, you know, because I don't believe in it. I'm a good person. I sit, I'm a monk, I'm in silence. I, you know, I sit on my cushion, I burn incense and candles and it all's good here. So I don't know. So I think that that is a false sense of, of of an engagement with life because we're interrelated. So I, I asked a group of people, you know, they were talking about when the Capitol was overrun and um, and and they were like, well, yeah, those aren't my people. You know, I don't know who that was, but at the same time, I said, were you not affected? Were you not affected by that? Whether you were there or not? 
that you even heard of it. Well, that's why I turned my computer off. You know, okay, well, that's okay. That's a solution. I said, but you still are affected because we're interrelated. We are interrelated. You are affected in some way. It, it, it drew fear, even if you think it didn't. It drew, oh my God, anything. It drew some response, shut down, go to sleep, shut your door. It, it drew some kind of, uh, you know, reaction. And I think those are, when it draws that reaction, that's the time. That's the time to walk through that fire, right? whatever that reaction is. And to see, you know, from what place are you going to engage and from what place are you going to speak? What place are you going to take action? You know, what, you know, take karma when we say that, right? Take action. And everything we do, every moment is, um, is changing the whole, right? Everybody is changing the whole in some way. Our, our talk right now, everyone's sitting here, everyone taking uh, the time to be here to engage, hopefully are coming uh, in that place of not just having, I've been calling it Buddha TV, but uh, yeah, because I have nothing else to do, nothing else is on TV, but oh, okay, let's see Zenju's on TV tonight. What channel? Oop. Okay, there she is. So, <laughs> you know. I'd watch that. Yeah, <laughs> you would watch that scene. <laughs> but what is it that we're doing here? What are you doing? What's your motivation? Is it for expansion? Is it for more knowledge that you know you're going to forget tomorrow? Are you, are you needing some kind of external stimulation? And you know that you can't, you know, I, I, I have been thinking about making a Zenju dial, you know, pull the string and she has a lot of talks, you know, talks like one of those dials, you know, because you can't have me. You can, all you got is you. Your life, your body, your senses, your, your way of being in the world. So when we come together here, we're being together in the world. In silence and, and, and speaking. And so when I engage and when I speak, um, if I just speak about just, I'm just coming to let you know how my life is, or what, what the world is like, that's to me not a Dharma talk in that sense, you know. But I'm coming because I have a strong, very strong um, feeling, and not only a feeling, but a um, way of in, that I want to share in terms of engaging the world. It's the same as my writing. So I'm trying to engage the teachings that I think in which wisdom has come through for me. Not that it be your wisdom, but maybe that will encourage others and inspire others to, you know, bring that through. But that the way is, is not through me or my books, but through your own life. So, um, yeah. Um, each sentence in, in all of my books could be another book always, you know, I, I just kind of smushed them all together and what, 120 pages, I don't know, 30,000 words. <laughs> That's what they give us, 30,000 words. So. But who's counting? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, they're getting longer, the books. <laughs> I like them when they're small. Hmm. Yeah, I feel that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I actually, I'm going to kind of shift the proceedings here, if okay. that's cool. So mm -hmm. here's the thing is if we were all in our building together at the end, we'd be like talking about Donna and generosity. And as you're leaving, there'd be this big, beautiful red bowl, but with a zoom meeting, when the meeting ends, everyone goes dink, and then the meeting is over. So it's not a good time to talk about Donna. So I'm gonna to talk about Donna right now. Donna means generosity or giving. And I'm gonna put a link in the chat. And for those of you who would like to express your gratitude for Zenju's teaching and wanna support what she's doing, you can click on that link and you can make a donation. 
So um, one, you can do it right now. I'm gonna talk for a minute because I've listened to enough public radio to know that that works. Um, so that gives you time to do it, but you might be like, I don't wanna leave the meeting and go down and get a credit card or whatever. That's cool. If you click on the link, make sure you have the link open for when the meeting ends. Uh, and if that doesn't work, the other thing you can do is just go to the Minnesota Zen Meditation Center website and right there under support meditation, there's a donate page and any, any funds we receive tonight will go directly uh, to, well, not directly, we'll send a check to Zenju because we want to support what Zenju is doing because I feel gratitude for what she is doing. And we know that part of holding each other up does include uh, an economy that involves money. So there's millions of ways to give and we know that. And there's a uh, natural, giving and transmission and Donna that we're all doing with our awareness and, and Zenju is sharing so beautifully with her teaching, but please give generously. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna come back into uh, our little conversation thing. And I see some questions have come into my chat. So I'm gonna look at those. Uh, and uh, and I'm going to ask this question from the uh, people watching. My question is, how do you find guidance to trust your own wisdom? How do you find guidance to trust your own wisdom? There's two, two things in that one question, <laughs> finding guidance and trusting wisdom. <clears throat> There's two parts to me. I don't know if, if you see it that way. Um, it's hard to define wisdom, I, I believe. But one of the elements that I, I feel that's a part of it is it's usually something that comes to your life that you never would have thought of. You never would have imagined. Um, I mean, sometimes when I'm writing, I, I never had those words until I started writing them. That's why I keep writing because I'm fascinated about what comes through. It's like, wow, okay. And uh, sometimes I'm like, <laughs> I don't even know how to respond to it. And, um, and when I can learn from my own writing, which I am, I do learn from my own writing. That's how I know that um, it's, it's wisdom of the earth, not, not what I've thought out. When I'm thinking things out or using others' knowledge, I tend to get a little bit of a headache. <laughs> my head gets really tight. I get uh, confused. That's the way I experience knowledge and things outside of wisdom. Wisdom seems to come through. It's like, I, I'm trying to catch, what was that? You know, and I'm trying to catch up with it. Like it's ahead of me. It's so broad, but you can't really grab it, right? You only can get a whiff of fragrance. Sometimes they talk about it in some traditions, the fragrance of wisdom. Like, uh, you know, you know that, oh, that, that was, that was a, a, a gardenia or you know, you start with, um, you know, some kind of honeysuckle and you smell it and it just goes by. You can't grab that smell of honeysuckle, you know. It's an experience you have in the moment and that's how I feel wisdom comes and in, in, in moves. And so, um, and that, so that, oh, how can you use it if it's keep, it keeps moving? Well, I don't need to use it because it's already given me that joy or, if it's a fragrance I don't want to smell, it's giving me something else. You know, it's already presented and it has done its thing, <laughs> you know. So um, guidance, uh, I've received a lot of guidance over many years um, from teachers, from books. I, I listen, I read, and then I go on about my own self to see what is what. Is what. I don't necessarily... Um, you know, I do maybe follow what the person's giving, but it's not like that to me, that's it. 
Um, my own teacher, Zen K. Blanche Hartman, used to say, I, I don't think I need to tell you anything because you're not going to listen anyway. You know? <laughs> <laughs> used to say that all the time you know and when she first said that I'm like well but I am I am listening <laughs> I was listening but I was listening taking what she was saying and then bringing it into my my experience and listening from that place you know listening from that place and I think that's for me the way um wisdom comes you know but um it's not like like I write a lot. There's editors that always saying, how about this word instead of that word? Well, then you have to sit with that word, you know? And um, like, I'm looking at the words and if they don't, it, they, they make sense. But if it doesn't feel right, I mean, it could be simple word. If it doesn't feel right inside my body, and sometimes I'll say it out loud, read the sentence out loud, then that just was the guidance. And they were trying to understand the essence of what I was trying to say. So then I tried to see what the essence is rather than just going on and putting that word in there that they suggest, mm. you know, plus, you know, when you're writing you're out and especially someone like myself, um, there's always a cultural differences between me and the editor, always. And so um, they're trying to make it uh, fit the mainstream. And, and I don't speak mainstream. I, and one reason that's why I wasn't going to even be a Dharma teacher or anything because I don't feel like I speak the way some of the teachers I've heard speak, you know, and I'm like, okay, I'm not like that. I only going to, I can only be me. I can only be myself. And uh, I told Zen K. Blanche that I said, now, you know, if you ordain me, then I'm going to be me. <laughs> you do know this, <laughs> you know? And she said, yes, I do. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> so we got an agreement. So, <laughs> you know, you have to, I think you learn to know yourself in, in the practice. And I mean, not just know how great you are, how well you can sit or how many sashings or practice periods would be, but know yourself. And I began to know the places in which I would just cave in and, and they would just happen. Sometimes right in the middle of a sashing, no one's done anything. And I've caved in like, wow, that just happened inside of me. You know, so I got to know that, that that was an experience inside me. Or then when I'm standing up strong, I'm like, wow, what happened there? That was an experience inside of me as well. You know, so I got to really um, experience and that ebb and flow in practice. And then over time, I could almost sense the time I was getting ready to cave in before I caved in. Or I was going to stand up even before I stood up, you know upright in my own life so I think those things just uh happen over time this is a long practice um it's it's a lifetime practice I don't even say long it's it's like forever you know um there are no there's no graduation you know you just don't graduate there are no degrees and the buddhist teachings aren't meant to be accomplished so you can stop and rest in the wisdom. You cannot accomplish any of it because it's not to be. If it were, then let's just um, close down this Buddha TV right now. <laughs> There's no need to engage. It's, if we're just got it all already, and you know, it's just not that way. It's it's a, it's we're seeking to live a particular way, and that's to live wholeheartedly and to live. Uh, knowing there's this unsurpassable life that, that the Buddha talks about. I just, I, I just, that thrills me, especially someone who's born in oppression. That feels, that just thrills me. Yeah. Thank you. So got more questions in here. I think this one's referring to uh, earlier, you were talking about being with a student and they were telling you about how they were non-dual. Yeah. I don't know if you remember that story. So the question comes thus, I'm not non-dual. Okay, I think it means like, I get that. I get I'm not non-dual. But are we not all non-dual together? Are we not non-dual together? 
are we not non-dual together? That means we're our dual. <laughs> See, I'm a writer now. <laughs> Two negatives together makes a positive. So, uh, <laughs> so anyway, um, it has nothing to do with us. Sorry. <laughs> Whether it's us together, whatever idea you have of it, it's not it. So then how do we know when we're, we're experiencing that? How do we know? And there are few, few signals. There are very few signals. There are some, there is some light there. So I don't want to depress you. There is some light. And that is when you're suffering. That's why we're here, all of us. Because all of us suffer. So we have taken up a practice, some of us forever, you know, so when we suffer that's that yeah you bring your suffering to your questions and you and you will in your quest and you will get, begin to understand the practice more rather than trying to get it understand it here you know so um non-dual is an aspiration we're all aspirants the non-dual experience so we are more aspirants than we are students I prefer the word aspirants than students because then students, we have to graduate. You need a teacher. You got to accomplish. You got to, uh, uh, uh. but if it's aspirant, you have a call and you know, there's no, you can as aspire to something all your life. And so that doesn't mean you're always seeking. It's just, you're as, just life. You're aspired to live life and live it fully. So, um, the non, the dual, and you know, there's a chapter, a really good one in um, beginners, Zen minds, beginners mind. I always get that back up, but did I do it backwards? Suzuki Roshi's book, uh, Zen mind, beginners mind. In that book, there's a whole chapter on non-duality, and um, and Zen, Zen really loves that topic, and and um, because we love that topic of emptiness. Uh, the topic of no self and uh, these these tend to collapse into each other uh, in Zen and um, I think that, that sometimes becomes a problem in our our uh, perception of our practice. Forget about perception of those things, but perception of our practice because they get collapsed: emptiness, no self, and um, non-duality. So um, in the Heart Sutra, the no is not about um, you know, no, it's not, it's not that no, it's no, like there's no nose in and of itself. There's no eyes in and of itself, no color in and of itself, no teacher in and of itself, no student in and of itself, you know? So right now I'm teaching, but the next minute I'm not, you know, because of conditions, right? Right. What, whatever's arising, whatever the conditions are. So, um, you know, non-duality is that way too. It's a, it's an experience and all of these things, again, let's bring it back to suffering. <laughs> it wasn't these kind of beautiful things weren't presented for us to accomplish, but for us to, to ease our suffering. So when we're suffering and suffering deeply, I think we've been given a teaching to say, perhaps, you know, your dualistic thinking and being is creating a situation for you that's causing suffering, mm. you know, because you're, I am somebody, I am the teacher. So what are you doing? You know, that <laughs> starts to create all the suffering with, you know, people, <laughs> you know, I am the president. I am this, I am the one with the knowledge, with the expertise. And therefore I'm not in the place of discovery that you're in, <laughs> you know, to the other people. So, you know, I, I, I use it quite a bit. When I'm suffering, I go, uh-oh, I must think, and I'm, I'm thinking I'm somebody. I'm thinking I'm better. I think I understand it and know something better than the other person. And it's called arrogance, right? When you <laughs> think you're the one that knows. That was kind of the first lesson I learned in Nisha was, you know, arrogant. I was actually told that because I was just going on and on about my roommate. And the woman just kept saying, you're just arrogant. You're arrogant, you know, it's like, what? 
you know, because it's a word I never used for myself. But whenever you think you're right or when you think you know, you are in that place. And some of us are very with that with our practice. We think we know how this should happen, you know, how this should happen, how this should go. That's not Zen. Oh, that's not um, that's not loving and kind. We have a lot of Buddhist cops. That's not loving and kind, <laughs> you know. Had someone tell me that before. Like you can get become loving and kind and carry it off. For, and every moment you have to prove to everybody you're that. Every moment of your life. But loving and kindness is an aspiration because conditions arise in which you may just turn around and not be as loving as you thought you were. Or what you think is loving is not what I think is loving. Mm -hmm. That's even the bigger one. Like, I'm being compassionate. I was trying to be compassionate. Well, already you're in trouble. <laughs> already. Your compassion, your idea of compassion. So then what a compassion are we working with then send you? Oh my God. You know, you're working on the compassion that it's honed through the wisdom you have honed in your practice. There's no compassion without any wisdom to rely upon. That is the heart sutra. That is the wisdom that's being talked about. The wisdom of the heart sutra is compassion. That's the wisdom. And yes, no self. No self just means no self in and of itself. I remember I was telling some people at Tassajara's eating something, lunch or something, and a bunch of more senior students were sitting around and were talking about no self and they were going on and on about no self. And I said, no, 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 that's not no self. And I was like, oh no, I'm not supposed <laughs> to be talking. You know, I'm a new student. I just started. And I said, you know, oh no, I'm already going down the wrong road because it's not, I might not be telling the truth. <laughs> and they stopped. They were like, what? I said, it doesn't mean, you know, not to be a person, a human being, you know, um, to not think of your, that you're a, your person. You know, I said, it means that you're interrelated to everything and everyone. That's what no self is. There's no independent self. There's a few words missing. <laughs> you know, but, you know, in, in the uh, teaching, if you read the teaching, go deeper, you'll get that. So then they were like, oh, and then I hurried up and ran down the main road to go see, I think it was Paul, to go see Paul Hollers, to make, tell him what I had done, you know, like a confession, like telling him what I had said about no self. And, you know, I said, I, I don't, I'm, it just came out of my mouth. I know I'm not supposed to be teaching. And I said, but tell me, that's how I feel about it. Is that what it really is about? And he said, you're correct. And I said, whew, because, oh, Lord, because we're going to, if, if I'm wrong, we're going to need a session. I just put a whole bunch of people, something wrong. <laughs> we're going to need a session. So I was happy, but still that was dangerous. That was very dangerous to, to um, impart to someone you know, how I saw it, but it was different than they saw it. It was a risk, you know? So, you know, I just invite everyone to stay in the uh, beginner's mind, in the discovery, you know, um, we can rattle off the Four Noble Truths or the Eightfold Path and all these different teachings, but what do they mean? I don't think Buddha was interested in us doing that, you know? I, I really, you know, a lot of people like the one, what, is it kind? Is it true? Is it necessary? You know, all, you know, when, which, you know, so you can be careful about what you say, you know, all these techniques, but it doesn't matter if you don't understand, um, you know, boundaries or you don't understand uh, loving heart or you, you're, um, you're, you don't see the suffering that a person's uh, experiencing, you know, it doesn't matter if you know that I, I said it because I thought it was kind and necessary. Yeah, doesn't matter if we're not in tune to the suffering. That it, it just doesn't matter. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah, yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs>
doesn't matter if we're not in tune to the suffering. Is this why we disabled the chat? Because everyone would have typed that back as a quotation into the chat for us all day. Yeah. Well, we got a recording so people can hear it later. <laughs> yeah. So, and we probably do have room if, if other people have questions for, for maybe a question or two more, but I have one here. Um, oh, uh, yeah, we may. Okay. So here says, uh, I notice and experience wisdom as, as it arises from my gut. Uh, lands, uh, sorry, I notice and experience wisdom as it arises from my gut, lands and speaks through me. Um, and guidance seemed to express itself via something that I hear. Perhaps maybe there's a dance between them. What was that? That's something that I didn't hear that part about. Something I'll, that... I'll read it again. Okay. Uh, notice and experience wisdom as it arises in my gut, lands and speaks through me. So the wisdom is like this arising mm -hmm. yeah. and guidance seems to express itself via something that I hear. Oh, okay. So then, then the kind of the question is perhaps maybe there's a dance between them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think you need to let it go. You're working too hard on what wisdom is in that it just, you're trying to triangulate, integrate it so that you can use it. I get it. However, you know, um, guidance don't always have to come from someone speaking or from words. You know, um, I think you can be guided by many things, but you know, your own life, something just being presented to you, you know, can can guide you and lead you. Because when I say guide, I think lead you to. I was guided to New Mexico by a picture of a mountain. <laughs> there are no words there the landscape in the picture. I didn't know where the place was <clears throat> at all. So I don't know, you know, uh, and I think that that's the thing about wisdom is it, it begs us to let it tell us what it is. And you'll know it because it'll just, I think, whatever, you know, you're talking a little bit about whoever asked that question out comes up out the body, you know, in, in the feeling you're, you're naming some things of the body. And I think that's a, a, a good place to trust. This is a body practice. Zen is a body practice. Zazen. And so it's, I think, um, to uh, engage it in, in its, its own, the soma intelligence is important. You know, and the other thing is many of us Zen practitioners and aspirants are very uh, scholarly and intellectual. We're A types usually, most of us. <laughs> so then we go into this, this practice of sitting and sitting and sitting and sitting. And this is the way I experienced it and being broken down. Like I feel like a beat down, you know? <laughs> I, that in order to release all of my scholarly knowledge and all the books I have read in like, you know, I used to have like so many books, you know, and I've gotten rid of them. I only kept the ones that if you open this book five times, you get to keep it, you know, so, but at not, it goes. And so I think that um, that's the way I felt. Zen was like, like a breaking down of this ego and this intellectual person who was on the dean's list, who has a PhD, who, who uh, graduated uh, magna cum laude in graduate school. That's pretty big, you know, do that. All those things are big in society, you know, to, to uh, I was offered um, free rides to uh, major universities like Cornell and learn, I had an opportunity to learn with Angela Davis. I didn't take up any of it. I didn't take up any of it. <laughs> I just wasn't led there. I, I guess the monk was coming out then. I didn't know what it was or the nun was coming through, you know, to not do, to live that kind of way, live in my head so much. And so, um, yeah, I, I, I think you're making some, in, in, some kind of integration of your own through your mind and then um, in deciding what is and what isn't. And that's taking up your energy for the, the, the wisdom to come through. Because if you're exhausted, 
and your mind's working, it's not coming. You know, it's kind of like if you believe in God, God's sitting back waiting for you to get done <laughs> with all the, your little gymnastics in your mind, in our mind, waiting for us to just release. And that's what Zen does. That's what a sashin does. I love sashin. A beautiful ritual to break you down <laughs> and let, so you can let go. So by day seven, all that's left is your weariness and a smile that it's over. That's it. Nothing else. Hopefully, unless you got busy in your room, you know, a lot of people do have TVs and computers now. They get real busy at night in those machines. We didn't have all that <laughs> when I was um, practicing. Not a lot of computers in the rooms or TVs <laughs> like they have now. But, um, <clears throat> you know, I think it's important to allow Zazen to be kind of a medicine to work on you and to take it and to not use the mind that you brought into the practice as the mind you're going to use to do the practice. I did that too. I came in because I was real smart. So I just used this mind. It didn't work. It really didn't work. Most people end up leaving because they can't use that mind to get this sitting thing together. <laughs> you're like, I, you know, they use their mind even to try to manipulate the sitting manipulate the schedule. Everything is in place. Organize. I can organize. You know, I came in and I, you know, I was a nonprofit administrator, manager, executive director when I came into Zen. So yeah, I knew I could help you run this place, you know. Uh, <laughs> you don't understand even how to run it, you know, my own judgment, <laughs> you know. So amazing. The mind amazing <laughs> <laughs> the mind is amazing yeah well this has been amazing your mind i'm sorry to say you might be disappointed to hear me pointing out now Zendu, your mind is amazing but uh really you know it's uh we know that mind is much bigger than that little mind. The mind, uh, the mind I am, I'm extolling uh, that you bring us is something vast, and I'm so grateful. And uh, I suspect uh, there's a lot of uh, opened hearts and opened minds in this little room of people. We haven't been watching Zenju TV, I don't think. There's something more. So. But I think we're, we're coming to the end of our time here. I get it. Before I close, I'll just ask if you want to say anything in closing, Zenju. But I do want to say we do have, um, uh, you can still register for the retreat tomorrow. So if you didn't sign up and you want to spend uh, some more time uh, with Zenju, and uh, you can just go to the MZMC website and sign up. And uh, I'm just so grateful for you taking the time to be with us tonight and really looking forward to being able to spend uh, the day with you tomorrow. Do you wanna uh, give us anything in closing or send us off? Mm, I, yes, I, you know, tomorrow we're talking about accessing peace, but just know that that the path is a path to access it. Um, I don't have any keys, to any doors. Um, I just uh, love to be joined in the walk. I love people who are willing to um, it just engage their entire life to a path and to be curious as you are, to ask questions. I love that. And that's what I enjoy. And that's all there is. And, and, and that's um, hopefully how this evening was experienced, you know, where you, you, you had some just joy and just listening and um, engaging in that way. And um, thank you for listening. And of course, you will have your own heart and mind around things. And as they say, whatever is not what you needed to hear, just what is it? Wash your ears out <laughs> and move on. Take what you can take. Matter of fact, just find a little piece, one sentence, one word from this whole evening, one word, and walk with it. 
for the next week or come with it tomorrow if you join us. We'll be doing a few exercises there. All right, that's it. Well, thank you so much, Zenju, for being with us. And thank you, everyone, for joining in this event. Really grateful to have the opportunity to practice with you tonight and wishing you all uh, love and well-being. Uh, may we all be at peace and we, uh, may we all offer peace. <laughs>